West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Before 1980, uh, there were two different Brigham hospitals in Boston that were both Harvard Med School teaching hospitals. There was also the Boston Hospital for Women, which is kind of a weird concept, but that's a thing that used to exist in medicine. Um, in 1975, those three different Harvard Medical School teaching hospitals, they all merged and they got a new name. They got the still awkward to this day name of Brigham and Women's. That is the name of the hospital. It's a major te teaching hospital. As I said, it is affiliated with Harvard Medical School. It's really prestigious. It's really accomplished. It's actually one of the most highly rated hospitals, not only in the United States, it's one of the most highly rated hospitals in the whole world. And a week and a half ago at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, this happened. Uh, they had an outbreak of Nazis. This is a neo-Nazi group uh, based in Worcester, Massachusetts. We know that because they put their email address on the threatening flyer that the group handed out at the hospital. Hi, Proton Mail. Your servers are being used as contact information for literal Nazi recruitment efforts in the United States. Did you know? Um, the, the Nazi group was out in front of Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, a week ago Saturday. They handed out flyers targeting two doctors by name, accusing them of anti-white genocidal policy. And these guys lined up in their little khaki pants, in their, their little matching shirts and their masks. And they held up this big sign, Brigham and Women's Hospital kills whites. Really? The hospital kills whites, kills white people. And so the Nazis are out there in front of the hospital on a Saturday morning defending all the poor white people from the doctors in the hospitals that are trying to kill all the white people. Why do the Nazis think that the hospitals are trying to kill the white people? Where do they get this from? Well, this happened exactly one week prior. The left is now rationing life-saving therapeutics based on race, discriminating against and denigrating just denigrating white people to determine who lives and who dies. If you're white, you don't get the vaccine, or if you're white, you don't get therapeutics. If you're white, you have to go to the back of the line to get medical help. Think of it. If you're white, you go right to the back of the line. Think of it. If you're white, you go right to the back of the line. That was Trump speaking Saturday the 15th. It was Saturday the 22nd, exactly one week later, there's the Nazis outside the hospital in Boston with their big sign, this hospital kills white people. Uh, they're, they're so pleased with themselves, they posted like a travelogue of themselves, all taking the tea in Boston, wearing their little Nazi outfits and handing out their Nazi flyers to people on the platform waiting for their train. The whole group of them throwing their little Heil Hitler's Nazi salutes on public transportation, doing the white power hand gesture thing. Oh wait, more Nazi salutes, never get tired of that one. 
This is Massachusetts last weekend. We're having a problem with this as a country right now. How are we dealing with it? Part of the way we are dealing with it is by good investigative reporting. Joining us now is Philip Martin. He is a senior investigative reporter for GBH News, which is an NPR station in Boston. Mr. Martin, it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thank you very much. Rachel, thank you. Much appreciated. Um, let me just ask if there's anything else that you've been able to report out about this disturbing demonstration, this group that showed up at the hospital in Boston. Is there anything that you can tell us about the, the size of this group, the, the other kind of stuff that they've been doing? We can talk about the size to some degree. Uh, your summary, by the way, was excellent. The um, the size, this has always been a minute um, and fringe organization, but right now they're part of what you see as a trend, the mainstreaming of extremism. This is a French group that has suddenly um, uh, attracted new members. We know that because the Anti-Defamation League of New England has been counting them and said that the demonstration outside of the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, that you uh, pointed out was larger than most of their demonstrations. On most occasions, they might attract four or five people. This time, they've attracted about two dozen people. Uh, that is still small when we talk about um, uh, organizations. But as far as an extreme right neo-Nazi organization, it's considered significant. One of the things that I thought was really interesting about, about your reporting, Philip, was to contextualize this over time. Um, this is not the first time these doctors have been targeted, including by name. And in this case, it was very disturbing to have their photos distributed, right, at their place of work. It's also not the same time the hospital has been targeted. I was really interested to have you put that in context in terms of the kinds of scholarly work they've done. So some of the pioneering research those doctors took part in um, was about um, heart failure. Patients, with patients in the hospital with heart failure have better outcomes when they're put on the cardiology unit rather than being treated in general medicine. Um, these doctors were among a research team that found that, all things being equal, black and Latino patients with heart failure were less likely to be put in the cardiology unit. And that's where you get better outcomes. It was a really specific kind of racial health disparity that they identified, that they proved, and that they've since been trying to fix. I just want to make sure that I understand that that right. That's the first time I had known about the link between those doctors and that research in, in your reporting. And is that part of the, the way they're being targeted for that kind of work? Well, that's right. Uh, what uh, you and many others, uh, most people would call uh, uh, sort of striving for equity and equality in medicine, uh, trying to get past the legacy of what uh, uh, Harriet Washington called um, uh, medical apartheid trying to create uh, justice within the medical field, uh, they identified a specific problem. That is, as you pointed out, uh, that uh, black, Latino, Latinx uh, patients were not receiving the same quality of care. And therefore, uh, they wanted to uh, level the, the playing field within the hospital system. Uh, that has been described by neo-Nazis, uh, who are essentially echoing others, such as uh, Donald Trump, I'm afraid, uh, that has been described as preferential treatment and anti-white. Uh, they are indeed echoing a, uh, a sentiment that is widespread on social media, uh, where the minute you mention equity in the context of medicine and many other things for that matter, it's uh, construed as anti-white. It's a very insidious type of propaganda uh, that we're hearing right now that years ago would be cons considered fringe and it's now uh it has now seeped not seeped it's flooded uh, into the mainstream and that's what we're dealing with right now rachel you know mr martin i'm i'm i put sort of tried to put this in context a little bit in terms of the medical community in boston um, because right. Boston has a, a big, powerful healthcare community. It is some of the best hospitals in the world. They do attract medical talent from all over the world. Um, now that this harassment and targeted harassment of individual doctors um, and to a certain degree individual hospitals has reached this level of scary and frankly, in my, to, my, to my eyes, disgusting um, levels, is there any sign that these doctors who have been personally targeted and terrorized like this, and, and the hospital too, are they getting support? Are they getting backup from the broader and, as I say, powerful, influential medical community in Boston and around New England? 
to a large degree, yes. The American Medical Association, for example, the AMA, traditionally a very conservative organization, not uh, always known for being uh, within the racial progress vanguard, if you will. They're led, their uh, uh, equity efforts are led by, uh, a, by a doctor who has done quite a bit, uh, Aletha May, uh, Maybank, who has been working tirelessly to basically um, create equity as the chief equity officer for the American Medical Association. They introduced a, uh, a plan uh, to attack structural racism within the, uh, the medical field and particularly within the AMA. And these doctors in Boston are also receiving support from fellow um, uh, doctors uh, at within the teaching hospitals, but specifically at Harvard Medical School. It, perhaps not as robust as it should be, and they're working on that. They recognize that there are internal problems within uh, the organization, and they're uh, and they're basically uh, zeroing in on that. It's the reason also why this report today, uh, the GBH report that you reference. We focus, yes, at the top on the neo-Nazis demonstrating and threatening these doctors, but we also zero in on their research. Very important. And that research is, in fact, receiving support uh, for around the country of uh, doctors like uh, uh, Manisha Sharma in California and uh, equity networks of various sorts, equal, ec uh, equal access, various uh, grassroots and progressive uh, organizations that are targeting the causes of inequality uh, and injustice within the medical field. It is Thursday, the 3rd of February of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Just a little, only a little. Hey, how are you doing? It's Thursday. We're moving on to the weekend. And I still have to say that uh, the weekends are much more enjoyable to look forward to now than before. Even though... The news and the tragedies and all of that continue apace. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I I get a little worried about what's happening in the streets of America. Uh, I just... <laughs> can you believe that Nazi showing up at a hospital complaining about white genocide? It's white genocide. Oh, because, you know, black and brown people were dying at terrible rates because they weren't admitted to the cardio unit. We have to rectify that problem. And once they start rectifying that problem, it's white genocide. You're going to let them in. <laughs> Everything is taking something away from them. There's nothing ever added. It's always taking away. They have such a piss poor attitude about themselves about humanity and the world itself. Look how they look how they treat it. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll just piss in the stream. We'll just throw these poisons in the stream. We'll just do whatever we want with the stream. And then complain because they get rashes and uh, they die at 40 because of uh, poisons and pissing in the stream. I remember reading about this uh, uh, society of island folk in the Pacific Islands. And they had not had much contact with the outside world until probably, I, I believe it was World War II. But uh, uh, in this society, they did not make the correlation between the act of sex and having a baby nine months later. They were just totally independent activities that had nothing to do with each other. You know, like they didn't get what cause and effect was. Now, I'm not making a value judgment on this. This is just what the the anthropologist uh, had discovered when they, uh, you know, <laughs> went and cataloged this island. And I, that, that always intrigued me that, uh, you know... I, I, by all accounts, the society was a rather peaceful society. There wasn't a lot of angst. 
the act of love was truly that, an act of love. And it was joyful and playful and it was all fun. There was no guilt involved until we came along. And then uh, uh, having a baby uh, nine months later, it was, hey, look at this, miracle. I think, I, I don't know if that was the actual translatable term, but uh, it was w- was not considered bad, shall we say. It was considered to be a glorious thing. So they, by all accounts, these island folk had a rather joyful and uh, ex- ex- existence, I'm going to get it out, and uh, a joyful existence and a caring for each other. And yet, <laughs> something that can, that's considered rather basic between you and I, that you have sex, the egg is fertilized with a sperm, and nine months later, there you go. And I've always applied that to certain aspects of human behavior. Now, I have never been able to find most white European behaviors that were ever considered joyful, playful, and caring for your fellows and gals. Especially when it came to the act of love. So when we have these neo-Nazis who Trump has embraced, who the whole of the GOP is, if not actually them, are giving sucker, sucker, sucker to them. Yeah, neo-Nazi sympathizers, they are allowing it to go on. And there is a racial component to it. You got Ted Cruz out there saying, oh, I don't know. You know, it's it's offensive. Offensive a black woman is being nominated. <laughs> They're just coming out and saying it. John Kennedy, that fool of a confederacy of dunces, came out and said, I want a jurist that can read a law book, knows the difference between a law book and J. Crew catalog. What the hell? And you think you know how to dress? You think you know how to to interpret the law? Now, when I use the term cracker for a fool like John Kennedy, it's a term of endearment, all right? It does not have a racial component to it. How dare you? And don't Whoopi Goldberg me on this, okay? Cracker does not have a racial component to it. And I'll tell you why. There are protected groups, and then there's us, meaning white people. Yeah, I'm going to count myself as white. Have to. (laughs) Jeez. A lot of my bloodline comes from the Cornish country. All those game hens. Yep. Oh, game hens. So... We <laughs> we can't we can't claim racism to us. We're the dominant prevailing group. My God, they're whining like, "Oh, we're got there, there's gonna be people equitable to us." That means I'm having something taken away from me. My soul is being ripped out of my very existence. Wow. Yeah, that's how Nazis think. And what do they do? Do they look inside themselves to find out why such dissonance is occurring so that they can change? No. They're going to go out and jackboot the rest of us to keep us quiet, to stop reminding them of how stunted and uh, maladapted they really are. So I've wondered recently that in the history of our country, we've been very draconian about those who, well, fall outside the norms of society to the point that we scraped out uh, little cavities behind their eyes, you know, lobotomies, gave them electric shock therapy, cold water, ice water uh, therapy. 
We've given tough love. We've given 12-step programs. You have to go to this 12-step program if you want to get out of jail. Okay. We've even made people sit in uh, Christian church missions waiting for a plate of food while they're being yelled at with fire and brimstone about what sinners they are. But now we have to coddle the neo-Nazis because we, well, we have to give them a fair shake. Well, I would think that giving them a fair shake would be treating them a little bit how everybody else has been treated. And I'll, 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 I'll compromise. I'll go straight from, you know, we can forego. We can forego, you know, putting them in a dungeon. Okay. We can forego hanging them on the wall of the dungeon. We can forego the rack to try to change, get them to change their ways. We can uh, uh, forego the uh, QAnon, Anon, 12-step program to get you off QAnon. We can forego all of that. I'm willing to go straight to the lobotomies. That's how fed up I am. Something has to be done. I've joked about all those gated communities are already built. All we have to do is turn the guard shacks around. Well, maybe we shouldn't make it a joke. Maybe we need to uh, start enacting uh, some acts to make that so. I know. We'll have to get rid of the filibuster. I would say that before we get rid of the filibuster, why don't we just get rid of the Republicans? We'll 14th Amendment them. If they continue with this big lie and continue with an effort to overthrow the election still, I would say those members are unfit for service as representatives of our democracy. They are part of an insurrection and by law, as specified in the Constitution of the United States of America, they shall not hold office now or ever again. And they should feel lucky they're not locked up in a brig, maybe offshore, you know, extrajudicial place. Treat them like how everybody else has been treated. You know, religious extremists who are outside all norms of society and use violence, intimidation, physical threats of violence, actual acting out of those threats. Yeah, maybe Guantanamo's too easy for them. There's space there now, okay? So we could hold a few there. And we got all those black rendition sites in like Poland and everywhere else. Let's go. Why, why don't we just use them? And other great news. We've got some teenagers who were apparently responsible for these bomb threats at historical black universities, colleges and universities. While at the same time being affiliated with Atomwassen. Ah, uh, neo-Nazis. Don't worry, they said. Racism in America is dead. Young people are moving away from racism, they said. Don't worry. We don't have to worry about racism in America anymore. We can throw out the Voting Rights Act. Well, you know, I read an article that John Roberts should retire this year, so I'm willing to throw John Roberts out for his efforts in gutting the Voting Rights Act. That's good enough for me. And I would also say any appointments that have been made that was uh, made from a individual nominated by a traitorous insurgent against the United States of America should be null and void. And I'm looking at you, the maggot Federalist Society cabal of, well, the Supreme Court, the six of the three. Well, I, I would go for the four. We could do that, maybe. Okay. 
All right. Well, we actually have some uh, a bit of a story about that cabal coming up. So why don't we give you some information about what is coming up here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. At the top, yes, neo-Nazis and Trump treat a racial disparity fix in health care as white genocide. We went through that. That's what they do. Yeah. Okay, race baiting. <laughs> On the rest of the menu, the reason Ron DeSantis ignores the racist history of urban planning is because then he'd have to admit it's systemic. The right-wing Federalist Society cabal at the Supreme Court is aiming to gut major opinions by those leftists, O'Connor and Kennedy. And the National Butterfly Center, who won a court victory against Trump's wall in Texas, had to close indefinitely because delusional Magus decided to comet pizza the sanctuary. And the sanctuary doesn't even have a basement either. These people... After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Mexican federal agents arrested a state security chief on torture charges. And with investigative journalists murdered at an alarming rate, a Mexican journalist narrowly escaped in Cancun when the attacker's pistol malfunctioned. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of that chat room link, across the page, to the left, near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and if you could possibly afford well how about an espresso type coffee drink and if you could afford to send those funds to us once a month it really helps us pay our bills and with that effort it allows us to then fly under the radar and continue this powerhouse of resistance against dark forces arrayed against the united states of america and representative democracy itself worldwide and your generosity has allowed us to fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended so many years ago. And all kidding aside, it is true. Thank you for your generosity and thank you in advance for those of you who uh, are considering and uh, to be generous to us in the future. We need the help. Thank you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime and then get that posted on Twitter and other social media platforms for your, well, show notes and uh, links edification. Pleasure. It is a pleasure. Anyway, that's where the real reportage is. And uh, check it out. Okay? Okay. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes. Yeah, we're on Spotify. I'm sorry. We'll figure it out. And uh, wherever podcasts can be found. And as a reminder, the Deep Archive for all the shows that have been, uh, you know, running through Netroots Radio all these many years, 11, almost 11 to be exact, uh, can be found at the Internet Archive. And we'll get a link up on our homepage real soon. Otherwise, check out the show notes and links. The links to that are there, indeed. 
All right, this uh, first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of The American Independent by the great Oliver Willis. Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis attacking the recently passed Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act told reporters that he didn't see how highways and other roads could be racially discriminatory. Man, we talked about this in junior high in the the late 60s. God, this is getting on my nerves. If DeSantis read up on the history of his state and others, he didn't, he'd encounter many examples of highway construction being used to destroy black and Latino communities. My God, they did that to the Fillmore! Jeez. The infrastructure legislation, which was signed into law by President Joe Biden, contains provisions designed to specifically address historical assaults and inequities contained in earlier infrastructure projects. They're saying that highways are racially discriminatory. I don't know how a road could be that, said DeSantis. This is the wokeification of federal policy when you see this stuff. Whenever someone uses woke as a pejorative, they're using the N-word. They're taking the lingo of uh, some of the diaspora. And that's what they do. Okay, They throw it back at you like it's the N-word. How about Antifa is one of the worst things in the world, according to them? What? Anti-fascism? Well, woke has become the right's catch-all term for efforts to undo previously discriminatory policies, along with a host of other ideas conservatives don't like. And that was the great Oliver Willis making that comment. In one example from DeSantis' own state, a black business district that thrived in a Tampa neighborhood nicknamed the Scrub between the 1910s and the 1960s was destroyed by the planning and construction of Interstate Highway I-275. A March 2021 report from the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Tampa region details the extent of the operation and the racist policies that determined where the new highway would be replaced. Referring to the scrub, plans from 1941 mentioned the need to do much towards clearing up a blighted slum north of Cass Streets and on both sides of Central. Oh, you mean where black people lived? A zoning plan from the following year stated there were several other smaller areas occupied now by colored people that should be eliminated and moved to other areas. That's right there in the plan. A plan in 1945 referred to the center of Tampa's black community as a, quote, cancerous infection ripe for a major operation to transform it into something economically sound and worthwhile from a civic standpoint. Oh, you mean white. The report also called the region an unnecessary and excess burden of expense to the taxpayers. Well... No wonder Ron DeSantis doesn't want you to know that. Mark Sherman of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. 
For many years, the Supreme Court moved to the left or right only as far as Justices Sandra Day O'Connor and Anthony Kennedy allowed. They held pivotal votes on a court closely divided between liberals and conservatives. Now, though, a more conservative court that includes two men who once worked for Kennedy at the high court is taking direct aim at major opinions written by the two justices now retired. The court already was weighing a dramatic rollback of abortion rights when last week it added cases that could end the use of race in college admissions and limit the reach of the nation's main water pollution law, the Clean Water Act. Kennedy and O'Connor, or both, wrote the opinions that have been called into question on all three topics. It's just evidence that the middle or center of the court has moved dramatically right, said Leah Littman, a University of Michigan law professor who once worked for Kennedy. Since Kennedy and O'Connor played pivotal roles in some of the court's biggest decisions, Littman said, it's not particularly surprising to see some of those decisions come under attack. It's moved so far right. Kennedy and O'Connor are considered leftists now, don't you know? A decision on abortion is expected by early summer. The other issues are expected to be argued in the fall and decided by June of 2023. Following Justice Stephen Breyer's announcement that he is retiring, a new justice is expected to be on the court when it hears the affirmative action and water pollution cases in the fall. But the change is unlikely to affect the outcomes or the balance on a court that will retain a 6-3 conservative majority because Federalist Society packed the courts with the help of Mitch McConnell, who I must say, in spite of uh, Joe's uh, honorific at the prayer breakfast this morning, is not an honorable man. This final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. A Texas butterfly sanctuary on the Mexican border has closed to the public indefinitely following escalating threats from supporters of Trump who are promoting a fabricated claim the sanctuary is part of a sex trafficking ring. Oh, they're going to come at pizza, a butterfly sanctuary. The National Butterfly Center in Mission, Texas, announced yesterday, Wednesday, it will remain closed for the immediate future, citing concerns for the safety of staff and visitors from the disruption caused by false and defamatory attacks directed by political operatives. Actually, a state representative and her aide showed up in a car And demanded, and and actually they were in the middle of the sanctuary where they weren't supposed to be, in a car, drove right into this area they're not supposed to be walking around in, were confronted by the director's son, and then they tried to run over the director's son with their car. The indefinite closure follows a three-day shutdown last weekend that coincided with a meeting in neighboring McAllen of border security advocates that attracted Trump supporters, including former National Security Advisor and traitor to America, Michael Flynn, who was pardoned by Trump in his final days in office. 
The Butterfly Center made itself an enemy of Trump supporters by filing a lawsuit in 2017 against his plan to build a border wall that would infringe on its property, saying the wall would harm wildlife and cut off two-thirds of the 100-acre nature preserve, effectively destroying it. Executive D- Director Mariana Trevino Wright has told reporters that conspiracy theorists have descended on the center in recent days, including two women who demanded access to off limit areas of the nature preserve so they could see illegals crossing on rafts. Trevino Wright provided audio of the encounter in which one woman accused the Butterfly Center of acquiescing to children being raped and another claimed to be the U.S. Secret Service. A scuffle ensued in which there seemed to be a physical contact and tussle of over someone grabbing a cell phone. Others have tar- targeted the center with social media attacks, including a meme alleging the center built a dock on the northern bank of the Rio Grande in order to aid smugglers. They're off the deep end, folks. Well, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. Some words imitate the sounds made by the things they describe, like buzz or hiss, or zip. For you language lovers, that's called onomatopoeia. But what if the way a word sounds could evoke some other feature of an object, like its shape? Well, a new study suggests not only that it can, but that the same word can do so across multiple languages. The findings are in the journal Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B. The researchers were interested in studying the evolution of language. Both the the ancient origins of language going back hundreds of thousands of years ago or maybe even millions of years ago, uh, and also the ongoing evolution of, of modern languages. Marcus Perlman, a lecturer at the University of Birmingham in the UK. He says that a century ago, linguists insisted that the words we assign to various objects and actions are essentially arbitrary and that words don't necessarily resemble or sound like the things to which they refer. There's nothing doggy sounding about the word dog or feline sounding about the word cat. Well, that makes sense, because different languages have different words for the same thing. One person's pup is another one's perro. But there's a lot of evidence now suggesting that the arbitrariness doctrine is proving to be false. Onomatopoeia is a case in point. And so is sign language, which makes frequent use of gestures that resemble their reference, like tracing the tracks of tears as a symbol for crying. To further explore this connection between words and their meanings, Perlman and his colleagues turned to something called the Booba Kiki effect. What it is about is that when you see two shapes, one looks like a cloud or like a flower, it's kind of roundish, and the other one is more spiky maybe looks more like a star. And when you're asked to say which one is booba, you will be more likely to point to a rounded one and for kiki to a spiky one. Alexandra Trick of the Leibniz Center General Linguistics in Berlin. She says that if you were to look at the words booba and kiki, which are totally made up, one possible explanation for the effect could be the appearance of the letters. The shape of B-O-U-B-A, right? The the shapes of those letters kind of evoke the sense of roundness. These letters are round. But what happens when you don't see the words, but hear them? And does it matter what language the listener speaks? So we thought that would be a wonderful idea to just uh, study Bubakiki across the world. 
With the help of 22 different collaborators, the researchers tested the Bubakiki effect in 25 different languages, from Albanian and Armenian all the way to Zulu, with Farsi, French, and Finnish in between. Participants were told to look at the two shapes and then listen to the sound, either Buba or Kiki. Then they were asked which shape corresponds to the sound, whether they were German Welche form gehört zu diesem Klang? or Spanish ¿Cuál figura corresponde al sonido? Russian. Для каждого слова, которое вы сейчас услышите, укажите, с какой из картинок оно у вас ассоциируется. Or Thai. Most participants said the rounder shape was booba and the pointy one was kiki. This suggests that the effect is legit. It does seem to be driven by some widely observed correspondence between the spoken words and visual features of the shapes. Well, there were some exceptions. Perlman says that speakers of Romanian, Turkish, and Mandarin Chinese were more likely to make the reverse call. Although my Turkish friend and her family fell squarely in the classic Buba Kiki camp. Baba has a round, fuller, and softer sound to it, and Kiki has a sharp and spiky sound like the spiky shape. As to what that could mean about the evolution of language, imagine our early ancestors, when they started using spoken words to refer to things. They couldn't say, Listen, my friend, now we're going to call this new object a table. So, to get the conversation off the ground, they probably tried to come up with sounds that somehow evoked the object at hand. And as a general principle, it might be that new words that are heard to resemble their reference uh, in some way or another would have been more likely to be understood and adapted by a wider community of speakers. So, if folks from far-flung cultures generally agree that booba is bulbous, while kiki is sharp, it shows us the potential of those correspondences to have been relevant at the very dawn of language, that in fact our ancestors could have relied upon those when establishing the first word forms. Schweck says she'd like to explore the effects of other nonsense words, ones that use different consonants and vowel sounds. But also testing real vocabularies of languages across these possible dimensions that evoke the sense of roundness or sharpness or maybe other uh, sensations in us because that might bring us closer to how the verse words came to be. Which means that Buba and Kiki will not be the last word. Special thanks to my friends Valerie Grieger, Denise Dalma, Yuri Lazebnik, Suhachia Tongteng, and Peri Asunar. For Scientific Americans, 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Huck. Booba Kiki. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Good eating habits developed in childhood can last a lifetime, but getting children to eat their fruits and vegetables is a common problem. Eating them adds important nutrients, helps control weight, and reduces the risks for many serious illnesses. Children in the U.S. are eating more fruit. However, 60% of children get fewer fruits than recommended, and 93% don't get enough vegetables. Child care, schools, and school districts can help change this by meeting or exceeding federal nutrition standards for meals and snacks, including fruits and vegetables wherever food is offered, and helping children learn about and taste fruits and vegetables. At home, parents can eat a variety of fruits and vegetables with their children and provide them as snacks, even if it takes many tries. Also, parents can include their children when shopping for, growing, and preparing fruits and vegetables. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. 
So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. You are listening to 60 Second Civics from the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. The Declaration of Independence contains ideas and arguments for independence that can be divided into several categories. Natural rights, human equality, government by consent, the long train of abuses by King George III, and finally, the right to revolution. The colonists' arguments from natural rights include the idea that the rights of the people are based on a higher law than laws made by humans. The existence of these rights, said the colonists, is self-evident. They are given by the laws of nature and of nature's God and are unalienable. In natural rights philosophy, the law of nature contains universally obligatory standards of justice and would prevail in the absence of man-made law. Neither constitutions nor governments can violate this higher law. If a government deprives the people of their natural rights, then the people have the right to change or abolish that government and to form a new government. That's all for today's episode, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. During the past year, there have been many stories of students walking out of public schools to protest the practices of community policing. This tactic has deep roots in the civil rights movement. On this day in labor history, the year was 1964, which saw nearly half a million African American and Puerto Rican students in New York City participating in a one-day school boycott. In addition to nearly half of the public school student population taking to the streets, thousands of demonstrators staged peaceful rallies across the city, gathering at the Board of Education, City Hall, and Governor Nelson Rockefeller's Manhattan office. The purpose of the boycott was to protest segregation and the poor conditions of many schools in black neighborhoods. Baird Rustin, one of the main architects of the 1963 March on Washington, helped local parents and community groups plan the highly successful event. The massive action drew attention from the national media. The boycott's coordinators approached the United Federation of Teachers, the city's teachers' union, for an endorsement of the action. The union, however, declined, although many teachers did individually support the effort. Despite the success of the action, the school board remained unwilling to change its policies. After the 1964 boycotts did not bring about the change that they had hoped, Rustin and many of the local black organizers of the protest went their different ways. Rustin closely aligned himself with the UFT. He hoped to use the union's power to build a labor civil rights coalition to effect change. Other members of the boycott coalition turned to black community power. They advocated for black community control of local school. These different tactics resulted in lingering tensions between black activists and the teachers' union that would help to shape New York's politics for the decades that follow. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon. On the west coast of the continental United States of America, where we are under partly cloudy conditions with a temperature right Now, at 28 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of 51. A few passing clouds tonight with lows in the mid to low 20s. And mostly cloudy skies early tomorrow. 
And then partly cloudy in the afternoon. Winds light and variable throughout with a high tomorrow in the low 50s. Let's get on with weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 50 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 48 with rain showers. Rome is 57 and fair. Kiev is 29 and cloudy. Kabul is 25 and clear. Hong Kong is 50 degrees and mostly cloudy. Tokyo is 41 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 65 degrees and also partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 46 degrees and fair. And New York, New York is 45 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Lizbeth Diaz of Reuters brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Mexican federal agents arrested the security chief of the central state of Agua Caliente on charges of torture, the attorney general's office told Reuters. The state government, which is ruled by the pan-opposition party, confirmed the arrest of Porforio Javier Sanchez, pledging in a statement full cooperation with federal authorities. The attorney general's office gave no detail about the torture charges. Sanchez has served as Agua Caliente's Secretary of Security since 2018. Previously, he worked in the now-defunct federal police and has ties to Mexico's former security chief, Luna, who is in detention in the, in the U.S., facing charges linked to a multi-million dollar bribery scheme designed to benefit the Sinaloa drug cartel. Reuters did not have any information about any legal representative for Sanchez. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, restez toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Fabiola Sanchez of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. Mexico's violence against journalists nearly claimed another victim, saved only when his attacker's pistol malfunctioned, in the Caribbean resort city of Cancun. Uh, Cordero Garcia, director general of the online news site CG Noticias, said the man told him yes on Tuesday night in the street in front of his home, I am going to kill you like a dog. Four journalists were murdered in Mexico in January alone. When the 47-year-old Cordero Garcia's attacker tried to fix his gun, the bullet fell out, allowing the journalist to knock him off the bicycle he was riding. Neighbors came to Garcia's aid, wrestled away the gun, and held him until the National Guard arrived to arrest him. Cordero Garcia said that he had been receiving threats by phone and message since last month. He noticed strangers passing his house in a gray vehicle and on motorcycles. So, ten days before the attack, he enrolled in the federal program to 
to protect journalists known as the Mechanism and was given a panic button in case of emergency. They want to silence me for my journalistic work, he said, without specifying who he suspected was behind the attack. I am very critical in my reporting, in my interviews. He said after the attack, he asked authorities to step up his security, and the state prosecutor's office said it had opened an investigation. Well, good. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on. And we will meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Ton mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au langue de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Ton mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver